So, um, so do you mind sharing a little bit about your story when you started to, you know? Yeah, plan? of course. Um, so my journey, I'm 54 now. Um, my journey, the entire journey started when I was 24 and I had to have a uh, radical hysterectomy due to uh, some pretty severe endometriosis. So I always knew that I couldn't have children and that really sort of guided most of my life decisions. You know, I married somebody who was older and was never going to expect children out of me because at the time, you know, technology just wasn't what it is today. And the ability to create a family didn't really exist unless you could adopt and he already had kids. And so I just sort of became that money and that was fine. And, and then when I was 46, my father passed away and it just, I don't know, something switched. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, I've missed a chap an entire chapter of my life. And I, in my opinion, yet still young enough and vibrant and, and I wanted a family and I went to my husband to talk about that and he said, oh, I'm too old. I can't, I can't do it again. And we made a very painful decision to separate. Um, and so I went down this path myself and, you know, obviously I, because of my hysterectomy and no spouse in the picture, I had to do all elements. So I had to do sperm donor, egg donor, and surrogate mm -hmm. and piece the entire puzzle together. So it was a long journey and you guys were amazing through it and, and wouldn't be here with my twin little seven-year-old terrorists if it wasn't for you, so. Well, and, and I, I enjoyed being on that journey with you, so. Yeah, and you guys were great, because, you know, I took a couple of turns. At one point, there was somebody involved who was going to be the, the father and the, the sperm side of the equation, and then, you know, didn't quite work out, and, and uh, you know, everything happens for a reason, yeah. That'd be my advice to anybody on this journey, just know that everything happens for a reason. There's there's light at the end of the tunnel. It might not be the tunnel you thought you were on, but it's, right. but it's there's always yeah there's always a way yeah yeah so how did you find donor concierge i found you i have i was referred to by a friend mm -hmm. so the funny thing is and, and i'm sure your viewers will will agree with this that like the second you put it out there that you're going to go on any journey like this IVF, you know mm -hmm. everybody has a doctor everybody has a person oh i know a great attorney oh i know we'll get you know blah. and you know sure enough someone said i have a friend who's been on the journey and we've had a ton of heartbreak and you should just talk to them for going any further, just so you can fully understand all the things that could go on. Not that they will, but just so you know what could go on. And sure enough, I called her, and, and she, I believe she was working with you guys, and, and she told me her very long, you know, story and journey and all the things. And and I was like, you know, don't be concierge, stay with her through all of the ups and downs and the twists and the turns and the changes and whatever. So to me, it was a no-brainer to you, she was. That's what you need. You need a team when you go through something like this, really. Right, right. Especially because needing all three elements, you know, yeah. on its own is fairly complicated. But when you need all three, it's that much more complicated. Right, right. I mean, if you just need the end donor, I suppose you could go through the, the, the clinic. I never loved that route because you never really had that much say in what the, who the end donor was to yeah. at the time. Uh, things may have changed. Uh, no. You know, <laughs> but you know, if you go through a clinic, they're like, "Okay, we got your donor. Let's go. Your cycles, whatever." And you're like, oh, "Okay, you know, <laughs> that's yeah. not a lot of control." And I like a little more control, even though there's not much control at all in this process. But right, right. Well, and I think many people do, you know, because it's kind of it's such a huge decision to make. You know, it's sort of um, as one woman said, "We're not shopping for pocketbooks." And of course, you know, that's exactly it. You can return the pocketbook. You know, it's, it's like this is something. Can't return the, can't return the, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So how did you happen to like, let's start with uh, say your egg donor. How did you choose your egg donor? Right. Okay. So again, in the beginning, there was someone else who was part of that decision-making process mm -hmm. and they had very different guidelines than I did. Because mm -hmm. in my opinion, the egg was sort of replacing my DNA. So I wanted personally somebody with similar coloring, creative, I'm a designer, so I wanted somebody creative and just with a good sense of humor. Not that she didn't have a sense of humor, but it, you know, I'm healthy. And, and that was really my guideline. Mm -hmm. The person I was engaged with at the time on this journey wanted, you know, IVD, SAT scores, and, you know, all this other stuff that uh, to me is the parent's role. Like, you know, somebody got great SAT scores probably because they had a tutor to help them test on the SAT. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't mean they're smart or not smart if they didn't get a great score. So I've never really based my decisions on things like that. Yeah. So once that situation was over, I, I believe I called you guys and said, like, okay, new parameters, blonde hair, blue eyed, nice girl, has proven fertility. Because at that point, we had gone through three or four egg donors and gone pretty far down the path. And, 
you know, one tested with Rantelax and one tested that she only had three follicles left and then something else happened with the other one. And so we we had signed three other contracts, none of which worked out, uh, which in the end was, was good for me. Because mm -hmm. then ultimately, the egg donor guide shows that that all my criteria was very soon examined. Right, right. Well, and, and that's why I, I always tell people because, you know, it's sort of like you, you think you can just go, okay, now we've got it and this is the perfect person, but there are things that come up that yeah. turn well, that's, you, you say fall in life, don't fall in love because there, if anything can go wrong, unfortunately, yeah. it often does go wrong and you need to be able to kind of go, I have to let go of that. Yeah. I mean, it's, we, we went through three egg contracts. And, you know, we, you know, once you're in contract, then you have to do all the site evals, and then you have to do all the medical evals, and you have to do mm -hmm. all the stuff. And, and we went pretty far down the path of all of them. Yeah. I remember one of the hardest calls I had to make was to the one that I had to tell she had fragile X and probably should not be having children herself. She was also probably going to need an egg donor. I mean, it was like, yeah. and it's someone in my position that was like, oh my God, I can't believe, you know, right. you can't tell, you tell somebody who just wanted to help have a family. Yeah. No, I know. And, and, and every once in a while that sort of thing happens, you know? Yeah. 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 So how about your sperm donor? How did you get <laughs> on your sperm donor? So the sperm donor what was the fastest of all the processes. I mean, I, again, I remember calling you guys and saying, okay, we've got, you know, this adorable egg donor creative type five, six, you know, let's balance that out with somebody, you know, who's perhaps tall and perhaps, you know, has, you know, a, a higher education and, and stuff like that. And again, blonde hair, blue eyes, you the coloring lines, and that was really so that. And you sent me three options, and one was, it's code name, you know, code name. So one code name was Radia, and my father had had, I was raised in Seattle, and my father at the time, before he passed, was living in a, in a, Kaplan on the side of Mount Rainier. And so to me, like, that was the donor. And that was really kind of the decision, which, you know, right or wrong, it worked out, but it was just because to me, that was like a little sign. Yeah. Which I think it's not unusual to have something like that be kind of like the deciding right. factor. Yeah. Sometimes it's just. Like right here from my area, blonde hair, blue eyes, tall Norwegian, plays tennis, I love tennis, farm yeah. so, well, you know, whatever the things were, it was it just sort of, I figured we'd balance out the egg donor nicely. Yeah. And and then the surrogate. <laughs> the surrogate, yeah. So again, you guys sent me two or three. And that was a very interesting process because I didn't know that I was then gonna have to create the profile to get a surrogate to choose. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of like on a dating app. You gotta do the pictures and this will be the baby's house and you know, this is the dog and like Auntie Lisa, you know, all those things. I didn't going into it, I didn't really realize and and so you know, I created this profile and then I just got panic stricken. I was like I've got the egg and the sperm. I'm never going to get a surrogate. Who's going to pick a single mother living in New York in a New York square apartment time to carry a baby for and put her life at risk and all those things that these amazing surrogates do? Yeah. And so I really thought it was going to take a long time. And then I got three or four profiles sent to me of girls that were willing to do it. And um, and one stood out and she, you know, I just liked her family. I liked her family values. I felt like She'd be okay carrying and comfortably having a child, like you know, all the things that you worry about. And you know, she was definitely done with her family making and and you know, she just had a really good family support because I think that's so important. Like if these girls don't have the back of their family while they do something like this for somebody else, it can get, you know, it can get dicey. But I could tell she had her family's support. And um, you know, that's why that's part of why I chose her. Yeah. 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 I also was limited to one state because of my no genetic tie scenario. I could only get a surrogate in California at the time. Now, again, I don't know if the laws have changed, but at the time, I could only have a tie. I could only have a surrogate in California in order to be on the birth certificate, which was very important to me. Right. Right. Um, I didn't want to then go through all of this and then have to try to adopt my own child. You know, that, like, that wasn't going to be how it went. <laughs> so, yeah, there's, there's, there's a few other states now that also yeah. offer that. Um, yeah. but I, I remember at the time, you know, that, you know, I was checking with the attorneys that we work with and they're like, yeah. here, here are your options, you know? So. Yeah, it was very complex and very limited in scope as to where I had to choose from. And it, and ultimately she lived one exit away from my sister on the freeway. 
So it became that, yeah, that's great. Very, very convenient. I would fly from New York every every month for all of her doctor's appointments and stay at my sister's and go to the doctor and fly the next day. And I got to meet all the ultrasounds and all of that. And, yeah. And it was great. We built we built a really nice friendship and relationship through that. No, oh, that's great. That, that's always really nice. Yeah. Because it is a much more interactive um, situation than choosing an egg donor or sperm donor who you don't normally get a chance to meet. Um, right. You know. right. Yeah. Yeah. And so what was your experience like with donor concierge? You guys were amazing. I mean, the patient's level, <laughs> first of all, that you have, because for us, it, you know, the emotions are just so intense. Every decision seems like the biggest decision you're ever going to make in your time. And, <laughs> and, and, Quite possibly the most money you're going to spend on something like that. You're going to talk about, I mean, my process was incredibly expensive. Yeah. Um, and most people would not have the fortune, the good fortune to be able to do that. So, but at the time, you know, I was really divorced and I had next, you know, amount. And so I was very conscious about it. And, and you guys just held my hand. And every time, you know, a wrench was thrown into the mix, you guys would calmly talk me through it and say, okay, yes, this happened. Here's what we do next. Or, this is our work around or whatever. And you were so patient and so kind and really so supportive. Like I always felt like I was a part of your family and I could call anybody in your office and you guys would take care of me. And it was, I, I had felt so much like I was on an island by myself during that process. Yeah. Just based on, you know, the new divorce and blah, blah, blah. You know, and uh, all my friends were like, oh my God, they're crazy. They're 46, why do you have a child so late? And, you know, and, and and you guys were just like, hey, it's gonna be great. We're gonna have a baby in the end, and you know, and whatever. I mean, you were just amazing, and and very uh, also. I don't know that word, but you never offered judgment against any opinions I had or anything like that. You really gave very calm advice. I guess. Yeah. It's great to hear that, you know, especially because, I mean, that is our goal. Our goal is to be your advocate and liaison through this process. Right, right. You know, we've done this thousands of times, you know, anyone going into this, they're right. going to do with this. And I, we always say, you don't know what you don't know, because that's right. really true <laughs> yeah. until you encounter it. And, and every once in a while, there's things that, you know, throw us a loop too, but we have more resources, you know? Right, so, right. Like, I mean, you have, uh, you don't have, you know, someone else on this journey can't possibly have. and you know, you guys like, listen, it's going to be okay. We're going to do this and we're going to get you in the right clinic. And this is who you should talk to. We're going to give you three offers in California, you know, whatever it is. I mean, I was in New York. How was I, how could I have known any facilities in California to go to and go to business? You know what I mean? Like, it, you just, and the attorneys that you recommend, it, just all of it. Like, you really are a concierge service for all of it. Yeah. So, what would you say the most joyful part of the process was? Oh, the most joyful, I think, was really getting to know my surrogate and her family, mm -hmm. as far as the process goes, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and you know, there's that day, of course, of, oh, it's the, the, you know, the stick is pink and blah, blah, you know, that's all fun and whatever, but, like, really, it was the relationship that I was able to build, mm -hmm. uh, not only with her, but, but you know, with you and, and some other people on the journey uh, was really the best part. Yeah. I mean, outside of course, having a child, but yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. getting a child, yeah. yeah. Um, it was really the friendships I made, and and you know the comfort that I felt on that path. Yeah. What was the most unexpected? Oh, uh, well, the most unexpected was for sure all the twists and turns, and the, the you know the setbacks with the various egg donors for various reasons, and. You know, because you don't expect that. Like you said earlier, you know, you pick the donor and you say, yeah, it's a double donor, and I've got this, and I've got the end schedule, you know, whatever. And, and and to get those phone calls, like, you know, this one's something like that, we got to start at round zero. Like, oh, my goodness. Yeah, because <laughs> and, and we, like, whenever these things come up, it's like, we also try to make sure, like, what can we do so that that sort of thing doesn't happen again? But some things you can't. You couldn't have. I don't think in yeah. my particular situation, you would have never known that the one had fragile had something done. Right. Nobody knows that. No. You would have never known, you know, at one point I did have a family member who went through all the testing and all that. And who would have known she only had three bottles left? I mean, like right. she was in her 20s. Like you do, do you know what I mean? Like her too, yes. 
the things that happened to me, I just would never have known. Like, right. Yeah. Yeah. So I know of one unexpected thing that was, I think, kind of like a, a big bonus. Oh, the twins. The twins. Yes. Yeah. 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 And which, because, you know, we try to aim for a single embryo transfer, but. Yeah, I, you know, and as a single parent, it was so funny because I had a dream. I never have dreams ever. Yeah. But if I have a dream and you're in it, it's probably going to come true. Like, I, whatever, I just have this weird permission thing. And I had a dream the night before the transfer and it was twins. Mm. And so when he came in the room and he said, you showed me this picture with six little, you know, embryos on it. And he's like, if you don't care about sex. You want to put it under a bed. If you care about sex, you have three of each and none of them But we'll have to talk about it if we care about sex. And I said, oh my God, this is going to be so much money. <laughs> I just get to work. Like literally, right after I was like, holy cow, let's just put in the best one. Don't tell me. I don't want to know. And uh, so they come back in, you know, they put it in her and he walks out of the room and I said, oh my God, they're going to twins. And she goes, what do you mean? I said, I'm telling you, it's going to split. She's like, no way. I'm like, I had a dream. It's going to split. <laughs> it's not gonna split, you know. Sorry. And then he comes back in the room and said, Do you want to know where it is? I'm like, no, don't tell me. We're gonna wait until we do the amnio or whatever it's gonna be fun. And you're okay, you know. <laughs> leave this list right here and we'll see how long it takes you to not look at it. And sure enough, 10 seconds he was out of the room. I picked it up and walked. I was like, oh my god, it's a boy. What am I gonna do with a boy? I don't really need girl boys. I don't want a girl, so now I'm panicked. Like Oh my God, just take them then. What, what, you know, and I'm reading about boys and how to raise boys and what you do with boys, you know. And then, you know, a couple of weeks later, we go in for the, whatever the next test is, one of the most of our feeds, and sure enough, I see a second little flutter and I say to him, I'm like, I think he's like, oh, you got my single channel. I'm like, I don't know. I think I saw another one there. So he has him move around and he finds the second group. He's like, oh my God, there's two. I'm like, yeah, could have told you that, you know. And, uh, and then my immediate thought was, oh my God, now I have two boys. What do I do with two boys? Right. I just wrapped my head around having one boy. <laughs> but yeah, that was definitely a shock. But, but a blessing. I mean, it, it's certainly a challenge, but a blessing. Yeah, yeah. I, I just, I, actually, I, I know it twins is a lot, but I was just so happy to hear, yeah. you know, that like, wow, you got this bonus of two. Yeah. I mean, I could have never done it twice. I could have never afforded it twice. I could have never had a second surgery. You know, it just like, None of that will happen again. So um, I'm thrilled with my results. Uh, yeah. You know, they were both in the hospital a long time. That's the one downside to twins is most likely you're going to have some NICU time and I have a lot of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was very difficult, but, you know, you're seven and a half now and very healthy and yeah. it's just something we had to move through, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So are you in touch with anyone else who has kind of created their family and, you know, through third party donor surrogate? Oh, so many. Yeah, a lot. Um, and I've also, so the embryos that I have left, I have, I don't know, I'm say the improper term. I don't know if it's donated or adopted out, whatever, but my remaining embryos have gone to somebody that I know that I think might have used you to get their surrogate. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so yeah. And then, of course, the friend that referred me to you several other people. I mean, that's the thing about being on this journey once you're on it. Mm -hmm. You just meet so many people that are also on it. And you, the amount of teams in the country that are really good at what they do is is limited in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And so everyone sort of circles through the same top tier people. And of course, then the frontier is, is the top. So so yeah, when there's several people have used you, everybody's been happy. Um, and, it's mm -hmm. and, and, and one of the other best things that has happened is when you went on occasion, called me and said, would you mind talking to an intended family? Yeah. They, you know, they, they, they just want, they need someone who's been through to talk to. And I love talking to those people. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I'm excited that you donated your, your remaining embryos. Yeah. Because I just think that is a huge pay it forward, you know, because, and, and it's interesting. Most of the people that I talk to who've been through this process are very open to that. And in fact, I am now on the board for um, an organization called Empower, which helps to educate people who are either thinking about looking for donated embryos or are wanting to donate their remaining embryos. And so it's a great organization. And, you know, I, I feel really good and positive about that. So is there any advice that you would like to share with, you know, hopeful parents who are considering this route? Yeah. Oh, um, advice. Just know that 
it's all worth it. It's a very hard journey, even if it goes smooth. Even if everything goes the way it's supposed to, it's a, it's a very, you know, hard journey because you're putting control of your child, future child, in somebody else's hands. You know, it's either a surrogate or an agon or sperm donor. You're praying the answer forms correctly and told you everything about them and, and all that stuff. And so you just have to have a little faith and you have to know that ultimately it's going to work out. Obviously, higher donor funds. Yeah, that's without question because you guys are best. Um, and then take their advice. Take you know, the people that you hire and you engage to do this for you, whether it's your fertility doctor or your attorneys or whatever, if you've hired them, hopefully you've researched them and you trust them to give you good advice and listen to their advice and listen to their cues. Because even when you guys didn't come straight out and give me a yes or a no, because I'm sure ethically maybe you couldn't have, you still gave me advice in the way you approach the scenario. We, we have to give you all the information because you in the end have to make the decision. We can't make it for you. Right, right, right. That's like I'm a realtor. Yeah. I'm a bank insider, and I'm the source of the source. I am not the source. I am the source of the source. I can tell you where to get your information. I can't give you the information. <laughs> right. I cannot make your decision, but I can tell you where to go to research so that you can make your decision. Yeah, okay. and it's very similar. Well, thank you, Jennifer. I really appreciate your time, and it's been so great to be able to catch up with you. Oh, you're welcome. My pleasure. My pleasure.